The Carina Nebula is a very special target. It's really easy, it's really big, it's really bright, but I want to take a deeper dive and show you a little bit more about what makes this target so special. Also, we have the winners to announce for the Bintel Korean Challenge, which we've been running for the last three months. And we've got some excellent, excellent winners. And all of you who submitted, of over a hundred of you who submitted entries, it was unbelievable to see such an influx of interest in this one beautiful target. My name is Dylan O'Donnell, and you're watching Star Stuff. Carina means keel, as in the keel of a ship, because what is now the Carina region used to be part of a bigger constellation region called Argo Narvis, which means large ship, but everyone complained the area is too broad to be used for blah, 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 I'm so bored. Who cares? Let's hear about the Death Star and the lasers. So here's the deal. There is a bright star called Canopus. That's the second brightest star in the sky after Sirius. The main feature, of course, in the region is the famous Carina Nebula, NGC 3372, which was apparently discovered in 1752, as if nobody had ever noticed the biggest, brightest nebula in the sky ever before that time. What the hell, Wikipedia? Now, the Carina region doesn't just have the Grand Nebula. It has shell nebulas, wolf raylet stars, clusters, planetary nebula, variable stars, a Seaford variable, globular clusters, and a bunch of galaxies, including a dwarf spheroid in our local group. It's busy. But from the 1600s, Eta Carr, the star in the big nebula, started to get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. Then in 1820, for two decades, it suddenly got brighter and brighter until it outshone even Canopus and became the second brightest star in the sky. This was called the Great Eruption and probably would have been amazing to watch over time. Astronomers today are still trying to work out how that's even possible. To reach that brightness, the star would have gone supernova and essentially died, shedding its stellar material and seeding the universe with heavy elements like gold. But it didn't. And we now think that Itakara is actually two stars and something funky is going on between them. It's hard to say because if we point mankind's biggest telescopes at the star, it's surrounded by stuff like an explosion, the remnants from the great eruption, itself a bipolar nebula called the homunculus. This feature is expanding and may actually dissipate in the next 10 years. It could be gone. Backyard astronomers with a bit of patience and a lot of focal length can even create animations of the blast by taking images over several years. If you have a 14 inch telescope, you should definitely be trying to grab a photo of this each year. The shock waves from this burst are traveling at three and a half thousand kilometers a second, which is insane. But more insane is that we are picking up laser emissions as well. That's right, frickin' lasers. It's still speculation, but unless we are watching a spaceship fight, the likely explanation is a naturally occurring ultraviolet laser generated by specific conditions in the interplay between the gas and the star. If that wasn't cool enough, all the models are telling us that Eta Car is about to explode. We can't say when, but it could be in the next million years, this decade, or even tomorrow. If it does, it will be the brightest supernova ever seen on Earth with a magnitude of negative 22. Minus 22. If you don't understand that, and I don't blame you, the lower the number, the brighter it is. To give you an idea, the brightest star in the sky is Sirius at negative 1.5 thereabouts. The full moon is negative 12, and the sun. So minus 22 for this supernova, it would be almost as bright as the sun. That is bonkers. They used to think that this event would kill us all. And if it was pointing at us, it probably would. But the likely angle of the jets in such an explosion, we can see from the homunculus it's pointed away from us, so we won't die, but we will get to take some amazing images. But let's get back to the nebula. In the nebula itself, which is huge, at least four times bigger than Orion, there are numerous smaller features Hubble has captured, like the southern pillars, the keyhole nebula, its cosmic ice sculptures, the treasure chest star cluster, and my personal favourite, God's middle finger. So you can see that photographing Carina can be done at wildly different focal lengths. You can take landscape Milky Way shots of Carina, wide field region shots, the Great Nebula itself, or any of its smaller features. It's really a gold mine, both figuratively and if Itacar goes supernova, quite literally. So now to announce the winners of the Bintel Carina Challenge, where we ask you guys to have a crack at Carina over the last three months. In no particular order, here are our five winners. Clint Hodgart with a glorious mono treatment of the Eta Carina complex, taken with a 115mm APO refractor and an SBIG STI mono CCD.
Greg Bock, who took this insane picture of the Keyhole Nebula. But notice it has God's middle finger, but it also has the homunculus, and you can clearly make out that explosion. This is a fantastic shot, Greg. Well done. Dave Manning with the Itacarina Nebula, taken with a Skywatcher Esprit 120 and a Sony A7R. This is a great example of one shot colour. Really well done. Nova Edgecombe, taken with a Celestron Edge HD 9 and a quarter and a ZWO 294MC Pro. Another one shot colour treatment. Well done. Rohan Hinton. Taken with a Skywatcher 190mm Mac Newt and a Nikon D7200. Congratulations to the winners, you're all going to receive a $100 voucher for store credit. And thanks to Bintel for running this challenge for the astronomy community. It was really well received and I think we're going to do it again. We'll put the full gallery online, but I'd like to make some special mentions to Anthea Wills, Chi Chan, Damien Finlayson, Dane Jago, Diego Colonello, Jessica Carlisle, John McLennan, Lawrence Papp, Malcolm Barker, Matt Watson, Neil Johnston, Paul Milvane, Rod Adjera, Simon Johnson, and Tony L. Hotelier. You guys all also submitted great work. And thanks to everyone who pointed their cameras to the sky to capture one of the most impressive things you can see in the Southern Hemisphere. And remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die, but not because of a supernova from Edekar. <laughs>